Hi, my name is Helen Jones, and I'm Children's Ministry Director here at Berrien Center Bible Church, and I want to invite you to join us in our new Love One More Holiday Edition. We found that it's so important to stay connected during these days, and so we want to provide some creative ways for that to happen. We want to encourage each other and bless each other and be in each other's lives. So this is how it's going to work. Once you sign up and fill out a form on our website, I will pair you up with some new family members. You might get new grandparents. You might get new grandkids. Or you might get a new aunt or uncle. So it's really going to be fun. Your family is just going to grow. And this is what you need to do then. You need to connect with your new family members at least twice a month through the months of December and January. Well, how do you do that? What does it look like? Well, the sky is the limit. You can start by calling them and, and getting to know them a little bit over the phone or email or text. You can make some cookies for them. Who doesn't love Christmas cookies? Or take a meal over. Kids can make cards for their new grandparents, or they can quote some of the scripture they've been memorizing out of the book of Matthew. You can ask them how you can pray for them, and then do it and check up on them. That would be really good. You can share scripture that's important to you. If you're a grandparent, you can ask your new grandkids to memorize a verse and maybe give them a little incentive to do so. That would be fun. Well, if you have not signed up yet, it's not too late, but you do need to do it pretty quickly. So go to our church website and look for that form, and I will look forward to hearing from you and finding some new family members. Thanks. Have a great month. How was Thanksgiving for you? Did you have a special meal at your house? Um, how did you especially give thanks to God? He's done so much for us, hasn't he? He made our world. He made us. He provides for us. He gives us food. He sent Jesus, his son, to rescue us. And he's getting a place ready for us, which I can't wait for. So I hope that you had took some time to give him thanks that special day. And I hope that you had a lot of fun with your family. Let's do our memory verse song next. It is John 3, 36. So go ahead and stand up and be ready to sing. Shall not see. Life. 
All right, we've been looking at the New Testament, and we learned about the temptation of Jesus. And remember, we always have a choice when we're tempted. We don't have to react and do the wrong thing. We can stop and think and then do the right thing, can't we? And that's what we need to practice doing and ask God to help us. We learned about Jesus' first miracle in Cana and how he um, saved the embarrassment of the bridegroom, right? They ran out of wine and Jesus made the water become wine. And we learned that not everybody knew about that. Just a few people knew what really happened. It wasn't quite time yet. Then we saw that he went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And when he got to the temple, it was a mess. Do you remember? The outer court had animals in it that they were selling and money changers and noise and smelly. And it was not a house of prayer. And so Jesus had righteous anger. It wasn't selfish anger. It was righteous anger. And he made them leave, didn't he? So that people who were coming to the temple could have a quiet place to pray and worship the Lord. We learned the difference between righteous anger and wrong anger. Usually wrong anger is when we react to somebody when they're doing something that we don't like. And that is wrong anger. Righteous anger is when we are frustrated and upset by the way somebody's treating God. And so we can gently tell them and use words, our words in a good way and help them to see that God is worthy of our praise and we need to be careful how we treat him. All right. Well, right after this, we find in the book of John, right after this, when while he's in Jerusalem, he started doing signs and miracles that everybody could see and people were amazed. So let's find out what happened next. I'm going to read in my Bible from John chapter 3. If you have yours, you can stop the tape for a minute, stop the video, and find your Bible and turn to John chapter 3. And I'm going to start with verse 1. Listen to what happened. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you're doing unless God is with him. Well, let's stop and think about that for a minute. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. That means he had studied the Old Testament from the time he was a little boy. He knew it backwards and forwards, the law of Moses, all the commandments, all the things that we learned about creation and the exodus from Egypt. He knew all that stuff. But he could tell something was different about Jesus. He was a very important man and very smart. Now, most of the Pharisees uh, were not so happy about Jesus, right? Because people were starting to listen to Jesus and not them. And they did not like that at all. So we find that Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night. Why do you think he came at night when it was dark? Well, I'm wondering if maybe he was a little afraid. He was maybe just not too sure about letting all his friends and fellow Pharisees and rulers know that he was interested in Jesus. That could be. It also could be that he was busy during the day and didn't have time. But it might be because he was afraid. We notice that he called Jesus rabbi. And that word means teacher. And it's a very respectful term. So he is treating Jesus as an important person. And he has noticed that Jesus has been doing signs and miracles, and he's interested. Well, let's see what Jesus said to him. Let's listen. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again. Hmm, that sounds confusing. This is what Nicodemus said. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he was not understanding at all. He was picturing like, how can I shrink and get into something this little and get inside my mother's tummy again? What does it mean to be born again? We're only born once. 
Well, Jesus was talking about something way different. He was talking about a spiritual birth that happens inside us. You see, we are all born sinners, aren't we? And we are spiritually dead, and we need to be born again so that we can talk to God and communicate with him. This is a change that happens in our spirits when we confess our sin and believe in Jesus. Did Nicodemus understand what he was saying, what Jesus was saying? <laughs> no, he really didn't at all. Well, let's see what happened next. I think Jesus is going to help him. Here's what Jesus told him next. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So he's trying to help Nicodemus understand by using an example of wind. Now, when the wind blows, sometimes you can hear it, can't you? Sometimes it's blowing so hard you can hear it, but you can't really see it. I brought my hair dryer along today, and I'm going to turn it on so it'll be really loud, okay? You can hear it. I can feel it, but I can't see the wind, can I? I can't see the wind at all, but you can see what the wind does. If I hold up this balloon and let it go, whoa, it flies away really quickly. You can see what the wind does. And so it is with a person who has put their trust in Jesus for salvation. You can't see what happened to them on the inside. We can't see it. When I asked Jesus to be my savior, I couldn't see anything, but you can see the results of it in a person's life. After I trusted in Jesus, I wanted to honor him. I wanted to worship him. I wanted to know his word. What else do you notice about people when they put their trust in Jesus? Do you know? Can you think of some things? I think people want to pray. They have hope in hard times because they know that we're just passing through and heaven is real. They can love God and they can understand him and they can love others. And we have the promise of eternal life. So those are all things that people can see. They can't see what happened in our hearts, but they can see the results of it. Well, Nicodemus was still having a hard time understanding. So how did Jesus help him next? Let's read it. He gave him an example that he would have known really, really well from the Old Testament. Here's what it said. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, if you remember when we studied the Old Testament, after the people of Israel were freed from slavery and were following Moses to the promised land, a whole bunch of poisonous snakes came into the camp and people were getting bit and it was really bad. They were getting really sick and some of them were dying. And so they asked Moses for help. Moses asked the Lord what he should do. And God told him to make a metal, a bronze serpent or a snake on a pole and set it up in the middle of the camp. And if anybody got bitten, they were supposed to go to that pole and look at it, and they would be healed. Now, did that require faith? It did. It required them to believe that looking at that and obeying God would heal them. Now, that's a picture of something that hadn't yet happened yet when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. Did you hear that it said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up? What was Jesus lifted up on? A cross, right? And what happens when we look at him and we believe in him that he is taking the punishment for our sin? We live eternally, don't we? And see, that's what it said in the last part of that verse. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Well, the next words Jesus said to Nicodemus are words that were, are so important, and you already know them. I'm guessing you do. If you're really little, you might not, but I think most of you learned the words that Jesus said to Nicodemus next 
It's John 3, 16. Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Whoa, I love that verse. And that's the verse that God, that Jesus told Nicodemus. Those are the words that Jesus told Nicodemus right then. He was the only one that heard them right at that moment. I wonder what he thought about them. Maybe he was confused a little bit. It was all hard to understand for him. But Jesus was telling him that God loved him. God loves you. God loves me. And that's why he sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sin on that cross, right? So that when we believe in him and ask him to forgive us and follow him, we have eternal life. We don't perish. Do you know what perish means? It means eternal suffering in hell. Yeah, Jesus took that for us. So that doesn't have to be our story. Our story can be believing in Jesus and spending eternity with him. And that's what I want to do for sure. Well, I'm glad Jesus told Nicodemus how he could be born again and gave him those kinds of examples. I don't know that Nicodemus totally understood at this point. He may not have, but he heard some really important things from Jesus. And we find his name again at the end of the book of John. He was there. He saw Jesus lifted up. And after Jesus died, do you know what Nicodemus did? He wasn't afraid anymore. He wasn't coming at night. He and another man, Joseph, were the two men that took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in linen, strips of cloth, and took it to the tomb and laid Jesus in the tomb. I think Nicodemus probably believed in Jesus. At least I'm sure hoping he did, because I would love to have a conversation with him in heaven someday. Well, I, I love thinking about all of that, and I just want to ask you, have you put your trust in Jesus? Do you recognize that you're a sinner? Are you sorry for your sin? Do you realize that Jesus took the punishment that you deserve on that cross? And have you asked him to be your Savior? And then when you start to follow him, your life looks different. It's not the same anymore. We have hope. We know God loves us. We can talk to him. We can understand his word through the spirit. And those are really, really exciting things. So what I want you to do right now, if you have put your trust in Jesus, I want you to take some time with your family and share your stories of when that happened. Tell each other how, when you put your trust in Jesus, it's really good to hear those from each other and from your mom and dad, or maybe your grandparents too. Um, that's really a fun thing to do. So go ahead and do that after we pray. Jesus, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you came to show that to us. You showed us the right way to live. You showed us what it means to put our faith in you. And you showed that to Nicodemus. And I just pray, Lord, that people would be able to see a difference in our lives. Help us to put away anger and to put away um, unkindness and those kinds of things. And I ask that you would help us through your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, that you would help us to obey you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.